Yo, people. What's up? Julio Ricardo Varela. Latino Rebels Radio Live. It is June 17, 2020. And it is the second show of the week. And if you've become a fan of the show the last couple of weeks, you would know that I just get to introduce my fabulous special correspondent friend, Ooh. Melina Bobadilla. How are you? Hi, Julio Ricardo Varela. I love multi-syllabic names. I know. It's like, it's like um, Melina Bobadilla, Julio Ricardo Varela. Melina, yeah, it's perfect. Exactly. It's... Uh, um, it has character, you know? I know. How are you doing? I the Last time I talked to you, we had this great show with uh, the fabulous Amanda Alcantara yes. on Thursday. And um, you're doing good? Everything? I'm doing great. Um, yeah. You know, I have everything that I need. Uh, the world is shifting in many ways, as it should be. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just watching that, contributing, um, memeing, posting, arguing. Uh, doing your her. thing. But so listen. Good, uh, so uh, it's your show, special correspondent. This is my favorite part of the week because I get to just like sit back and watch an amazing conversation. So let me turn it over to you, and then you can introduce our special guest. Yes. Thank you so much. Hello, Latino Rebels Live Show listeners and followers. Thank you for coming back. Thanks for showing up on Wednesday. You heard Julio. He said this is my show. So we're about to get this party started. DJ? Just kidding. I don't have a DJ here yet. Um, I'm really excited about today's guest because um, she's a brilliant author, a, an amazing thinker, storyteller. And I like to fancy myself and, and call her a friend also. And I think something that I love about our friendship is that it's a very millennial 2020. Um, I think that we... We have a long distance friendship and we've able to we've been able to cultivate that um, across multiple technological platforms. So without further ado, the amazing Kali Fajardo Anstein. Uh, she's in Denver. She wrote Sabrina and Corina, which I'm sure you've seen all the buzz about. I found out a bit from uh, Yossi Reyes's book club. So shout out to Yossi. And um she has a myriad long list of awards that that and accolades that this book has been recognized for and really something that's super super notable is that she was a finalist for the national book award which is huge so welcome Dali Fajardo Einstein how are you I'm great hi Melina I I also fancy you a friend <laughs> so we sound quite you. Victorian don't we <laughs> yes, yes. it's a little golden girl humor yes <laughs> So um, thank you so much for being here. You are on Mountain Time right now. You're in Denver. And uh, I just, I want to start off by really talking about uh, and highlighting your positionality, right, at this moment. So if you saw our announcement for the show on social media, it's uh, writing in the time of anti-racism. Anti-racism, uh, or writing as a tool uh, towards being anti-racist. So with that being said, let's go to that idea, that, that idea of your positionality. What's the, the social and political context that you've grown up in that has shaped you? Um, and how are you responding to this moment in time with that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a big question. And there's so, there's so many layers to unpack. But I, I think I'll start with just what was, you know, my driving impulse to write and understanding that my family had faced generations of injustice. And I think that was something that I knew from the time I was a little girl from witnessing and also just from hearing the stories. And I knew I wanted to be a storyteller forever. That's just like, mm -hmm. that was just in my DNA. Um, and when I really started, you know, reading lots of literature, I was in middle school and high school and I was consuming all these books and they were all written by white men. And I wasn't seeing the people that I had come from in Colorado in these books. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really started writing as a sort of, one, I was obsessed with craft and I loved literature and I wanted to, I wanted to contribute and be part of the world of books. But two mm -hmm. is like, I wanted to provide this sort of activism where I was going to center our lives as Chicanos from Colorado, from Southern Colorado, from Northern New Mexico, who are incredibly mixed, who have indigenous roots. I wanted to center those lives and put them into literature and also like give them full, um, full 
bodies and you know consciousness and mm -hmm. have to have them be contended with as full characters. Right. So along the way of that process, I really faced a lot of challenges with people turning away the work. And that's where my positionality came from is that I, I became you know, pretty radical in that, you know, we mm -hmm. have to be anti-racist if we're right. going to, if we're ever going to have the true breadth of what our artwork and our technology and our knowledge can provide, we mm -hmm. have to start seeing every single human being as a full human being. And yeah, I'm, I, I'm positioned on the side of like, yeah, there's some some very bad things that have been plaguing this country since its inception and before that with colonization. And I hope that through my work, some of that can be reflected. But I also hope that we can take some of this knowledge and this information and we can start rebuilding pathways that will provide more equality, more justice and more right. community. And I, I like to do it through storytelling. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really happy that I was given that gift from my ancestors. Right. That's so beautiful. And I think that's one of the most powerful things for me as I've experienced your work um, and really journeying, honestly, with your ancestors and, and with your um, the way that you capture memory and the way that you really root it not only in ancestors in that spirit, but their connection to the land. So um, I've always found, you know, in my experience reading your books, that that the the land that your family and and uh, your your ancestors occupy that are, are rather um, shaped and and live in uh, is another character in your yeah. stories. So can you talk a little bit about that? Um, what is what is unique about where you grew up? What uh, what makes it different um and and how does that inform your work yeah so i think it's like a two-part question so the work itself sabrina and karina has 11 short stories and they're all set in colorado which was pretty i mean it shouldn't be radical but it was pretty radical yeah. to set a book about latinas all in the state where i come from because i just i'd never seen it before um, right and so they all come from colorado they're all set in denver or there's a fictional town that I've invented in Southern Colorado that I work with a lot. And it started off as like a natural thing that I was building toward. I didn't know why I was just writing these stories that were set in mm -hmm. our land base. But over time I started to understand that I'm a placed person. I am a person who is embedded in the inception of the Southwest. My, my great grandmother's people were Pueblo people um, from the Picaries Pueblo. And she was mixed, you know, with European and, you know, Mexicano, but she, you know, she came from the land base that I'm still in. I'm not that far away from it. Um, so it was really, I wanted to make sure our connection to the land was visible and palpable. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of how did I get to the point where I was writing a book about it? Like, what was my life growing up here? It was really interesting because you know, I grew up, uh, my mom is a big activist in Denver. Her name is Renee Fajardo. Um, I grew up in Aztec, you know, Danza. I grew up around a lot of, you know, art activists, community activists, and we were all Chicano and we were very proud of that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I didn't get a lot of education about, wait a second, like, why do we all have similar last names? Like, what is our common lineage from the Pueblos of northern right. New Mexico? Why do we eat similar foods? Why are the beans the same? Why is the green chile the same? Why are enchiladas yeah. the same? You know what I mean? Like, it was just this very, like, wait a second, because we're a community. <laughs> and then I started to understand, oh, and they never once mentioned us in my public school education. Right. I was never in my textbooks. I right. never saw any reference. Oh, by the way, there are these people that were the original inhabitants and they're still here and they're mixed now. Right. Um, and so I think with my work, I'm trying to explore storytelling and I'm trying to write good literature, but I'm also trying to show you there is very ancient people that have been here for a very yes. long time and we're still here. Right. And, and, the, the ancient people, as you say, that have always been connected to that land, that geographic point of the earth, were there before uh, different nation states claim, laid claim to the land. Um, and, and so I want to go back to this word, um, this idea of, of that mixture, right, of, of being mixed. So talk about the way that you, you identify, um, because, you know, I'm a Chicana from Los Angeles, born and raised here. 
And I know that our experiences are very different, but there's still something that is really unifying. So if you could just kind of like un- unpack how you how you assemble your identity, how, yeah. how you talk about it um, and what that looks like being someone from, from Colorado. Yeah, definitely. So I think that, I think that one of the, the earliest questions I would ever get when I was growing up, especially from Anglos, um, was what are you? What are you? What are you? You know, they would look <laughs> at me and they would say, oh, this person's not. This are you a tree? <laughs> yeah, like, what is this person? Yeah. And so I was positioned early on to have to explain what I am. Right. And I had a lot of knowledge of what I was because I was still around my people. I'm still around them to this day. Um, so here's what I am. My great grandmother right. was a person who was indigenous. Um, she had a European minor father who abandoned the family. There were eight children. Um, they eventually migrated north to Denver in the 1930s. They laid down roots and they started living in the west side of Denver and they started living in the north side, which are historically now, these are still neighborhoods that are Latino. Um, and they're being gentrified. Others came into my line. My great grandmother married a man from the Philippines. My mother married an Anglo man from Nebraska. And so I am an incredible mixture of people, but I still grew up with a primary Latinx identity with our food and our storytelling. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was not, I was not removed from the mixture and the mestizaje, you know, I wasn't removed from it. And so I didn't really feel like when I was Growing up, I didn't know that there was a lot of us who shared these similar characteristics. Because I think, you know, we talk about divide and conquer. One of the things that happens with divide and conquer is, you know, you can assimilate. You can force people to assimilate and then they don't have access to each other anymore. And it's only through publishing Sabrina and Corina that I have been able to meet others who are telling me, my great grandma was a Gallegos. Um, she grew up in the San Luis Valley. I'm yeah. also part Filipino. My great grandfather was a, f- a farm worker, just like you know your family members. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is blowing my mind that it was hidden from me and that I didn't have access to this kind of unity before. Right. Um, so yeah, I come from a very complicated mixture, but at the same time, I think a lot of us who come from this part of the Southwest, they come from this sort of history of colonization and this history of mixing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you said that you were consistently questioned, right? That your, your identity was immediately read as, as other, right? By virtue of someone asking you, singling you out because of your, the way that you walk in the world, um, that in and of itself, um, I think if you step back and look at it, you don't really have to step back. It's pretty obvious that othering, um, is really rooted in, in a white supremacy, right? Like your, your identity, your existence is not the norm or it's not, um, the, it, it, it's, it doesn't reflect what others who hold power historically look like, right? Um, nonetheless valuable and, and, and integral to, I mean, to that, to that, that land. Um, but I think that gets me thinking about this idea of, of you as an, an anti-racist uh, writer, as a storyteller. And I know that we, you know, we talked about that. We, we've had conversations unpacking that idea. Well, am I anti-racist? And I think that just, forgive my, uh, my headphones, uh, they're on strike today. But I think <laughs> if we unpack that, that idea um, of being intentional, being anti-racist, uh, letting that lead in how you how you tell your stories, how you do your work. And also, I mean, even, you know, I I can't discount the importance of honestly, like a social media presence. And I know Mm -hmm. that probably a lot of your fans, uh, because you have droves of fans on social media, are watching the show for the first time because they want, they love to hear you speak. So um, I want to talk a little bit about that and and kind of pivot there. Um, So you mentioned also that you didn't read stories, not, not only in school, in history books, Mm-hmm. about people like you and your family. Um, but do stories like like the ones that you've written in Sabrina Karina, do they exist a lot in, in fiction world? Do we see that in, in the lit world? What's, I think, what's been your experience there? I think not not yet as much. And I, I hope that my book can um, create more pathways for more books like mine to get published. And I, 
I didn't have a very easy time getting the book published, but once it was published, it, it had its own life. Right. Um, and so I'm hoping that because the, the gate's been opened a little bit, more can come through. Right. But in terms of what kinds of work that I saw that did reflect um, this complicated mixture. Yeah. Um, and you influenced know, you, yeah. And influenced me. So obviously, like, I'm very influenced by some of the, ma you know, the major Latinas, like Ana Castillo and Sarge Cisneros and um, Elena Maria Villarmontes. But I'm very, very influenced by Black writers, African-American writers. Toni Morrison's Beloved taught me in, you know, insane amounts of information about how to research my people and how to put that into storytelling. Right. Edward P. Jones's short story collection, Lost in the City, which focuses on African-Americans set in Washington, D.C., is without that book, there would be no Sabrina and Karina uh -huh. because it taught me how to tell the story of a city from different vantage points, from different characters. James Baldwin's work um, significantly influenced me. And, you know, the list goes on and on about, you know, where I was learning and where I was trying to pull from. Yeah. And I think... Um, I really, I do like to, to talk about, the, you know, the African-American writers and their influence on my work, because in some ways it, it gave me, gave me so much um, knowledge that I didn't know was possible. I didn't have to center a white reader. I could mm -hmm. just tell the stories the way that I was experiencing them. Um, and I've also, a lot of my teachers have been black and they have mm -hmm. really helped me and found me different resources and connected me to other writers of color, black and indigenous writers. And so, yeah, it's, I'm hoping that because my work exists now and because there's other work that's like mine, um, that we will have more and more of it. And I used to joke when I was younger that, you know, I was, maybe I was sort of ahead of the trend by being so mixed, you know, and like mm. America will get there. But I don't think that's true. I think that people like me were just hidden. I think that it was too complicated for the American narrative. I think right. that we would we were given that idea that we were a melting pot. Right. Not, you, you know, you come into the melting pot and everything sort of disperses and you can't see the different parts anymore. Right. Um, and so what that does to somebody like me is it it tells you that you can't be all the things you are. You right. have to meld into something new. And I just I simply reject that. I can be the things that I come from. I can represent all these different elements, and so can my storytelling. Right. And I'm I'm always just so moved by how know how many people connect with it across cultures and you know across regions yeah um so you know I, I just I have to take a moment because um again in in this spirit of of kind of leading with this idea of anti-racism and holding space and you being someone that holds space in the literary world and as a storyteller um you know, you're you're also you're a historian. I I, I think I don't know if you call yourself that, but, <laughs> but I feel like I get that when I read your stories, um, because the deep research that you've done that is connected to the history of the land is there. But also, I, I what I was gonna say is I I want to take a moment and really I want to highlight honestly like the trajectory of your book. Um, and I, I, I have to honestly, like, I, I want to list some of the, the awards that you've been, that Sabrina, Karina, and, and you have been um, nominated for. So you're a finalist for the Penn Bingham Prize uh, and the Story Prize. Uh, you're the 2019 recipient of the Denver Mayor's Award for Global Impact in the Arts. Um, your essay, just your newest essay, which is super exciting. Short, and, short story. And, sorry, short story. Short story. <laughs> yeah. Not Lit World. Um, <laughs> just appeared in Oprah magazine on Sunday, which is huge. And, and I say this like, yeah, I'm going to gas you up. You're my friend. And I think you're amazing and brilliant and talented, but to have had this trajectory, um, that wasn't easy. You're, you didn't get this crazy advance and people weren't just like, oh, you didn't, I don't, I don't know if there was a bidding war, but I can imagine that no. your experience <laughs> is probably different from that of, of white writers. So it's it's important for me to to highlight the recognition um, because it wasn't an easy path, but once the work was out there, it spoke for itself. And so so that kind of um, that takes me to this this question because um, I saw right now you know this, the moment of reckoning, people are um, getting really invigorated, and um, I think woken up I think many people were already there right I don't want to say like oh 
you know, I just realized there was racism. I just realized there was inequity in this world. No, but I think that there's this peeling back of the curtain. I think we're seeing people get uh, animated uh, in support and, and to walk alongside and to be accomplices with the movement for black lives. And that is automatically connected to this pushback against white supremacy, dismantling of that, and to being intentional about anti-racism. And so one of the things that I saw trending on Twitter recently was this hashtag, and I didn't really understanding understand it at first, because it's not my world, but the <laughs> hashtag of publishing paid me. Can you can you like unpack that for folks that don't know what yeah. that is? Yeah, I can talk about it a little bit. Um so I actually, I, I wasn't on Twitter while it was happening. And so friends were texting me. They were just like, dude, are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? And it was, it was popping up sort of organically from yeah. what I heard because I wasn't there that day. But um, writers were sharing how much money they got for their book advances. And immediately there became this huge discrepancy between white writers, white writers were getting, in some cases, over a million dollars for a debut. And no one had ever heard of that writer. Right. And maybe the right. book didn't necessarily even sell that well. You know, by golly, I'm gonna, <laughs> by golly, the publisher <laughs> right. try somehow. Um, then, yeah, um, and then you know, writers were coming out. Roxanne Gay was sharing her advance numbers. They're much, much lower. You know, I think one was fifteen thousand dollars, and they were they were moving up steadily. Um, mm. The the one that really broke a lot of hearts, and I actually, I remember, I started crying when I was reading the comments from all the readers was Jasmine Ward, um, who is, she's won the National Book Award twice. You know, the first woman in history, first black person in history. Um, one of the only people in history that has done this. Um, but she wasn't able to even get $100,000 for her follow-up after her, um, her first novel that won the National Book Award and Salvage the Bones. And so, Sing the Unburied Sing, she wasn't able to get even $100,000. And then you have debuts who are saying, right. oh, I got, I got $200,000 for mine. And culturally, that you know, those books, they haven't had such a wide reach. They, they are, um, you know, for us, you know, for people of color, for black people and indigenous people, some of these books are changing our lives. They're literally like rebuilding our consciousness and showing us what we're capable of thinking right. and how expansive our hearts can be. These are right. very important books. And right. the publishers are not, um, they're not investing as much money as that as they probably should to reflect that. And so now, that also means that they don't put as much money into um, advertising because right. it shows how much money we're going, we're willing to invest in you up front. Absolutely. Um, I have a few guesses about why that is. Why do you think that is? I think, well, for one, I think that we, we're not traditionally the book to, to the, the major publishing world. Uh, people of color are not necessarily the traditional book buying market, which is absolutely nonsense. We, right. we're like OG storytellers. We love stories. We love right. books. You know what I mean? Like if they would market to us. We might love them even more. Uh, but I think it has to do with just dismissing us, you know, dismissing us as a serious market, dismissing our talent, not thinking that our, our books mm -hmm. are as viable or as important. Right. And that has to do with the, the mindset of who is reading it and who's making these decisions on the right. back end. So there's a lot of reasons, but ultimately it, do, it does come down to white supremacy. Right. Uh, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> and so um, it, it, it's this, it's this, dismissal it's this assumption that our stories are niche or somehow outside of what can be validated as an American experience um and so I sometimes I get ahead of myself with my excitement in, in you know unpacking your experience and the book but I know that there's some folks watching right now that have read it that have maybe reread it I I read it I literally have it right here <laughs> um, and I also recently got the audiobook, so I wanted to have that experience. Uh, but for the folks that are watching that don't know about Sabrina and Karina, can you just kind of give a little bit, a little concise kind of description? Um, yeah, yeah, of I would this love beautiful to. work of yours. Yeah, I would love to. So. Sabrina and Karina is a collection of 11 short stories and they follow the lives of women ranging from the age of 10 years old all the way to 84 years old. 
and they're all Chicanas of indigenous ancestry who are mixed in many cases, living in Denver and Southern Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, the title story, Sabrina and Karina, focuses on two cousins, Sabrina, who was sadly killed at the beginning of the story, and Karina, who is a makeup artist at Macy's, and she's been asked by the family if she will do the makeup for the funeral, literally covering up Sabrina's wounds from her violent death at the hands of a man. Sugar Babies is the first story, and it's not as dark, and it's... <laughs> it's um, you know, it's about having to raise a sack of sugar in sixth grade as if it were a real baby. And it follows right. the character Sierra and her, her partner, Robbie. And Robbie, with his friends, has uncovered an indigenous burial site um, on the outskirts of town. And it brings all these, you know, white archaeologists to their town and they're uncovering these bones. And at the same time, Sierra has to deal with her mother coming back into town after she's right. abandoned the family. So a lot of the themes that I deal with are gentrification, abandonment, and identity and connection to our land and where we right. come from. Right. And and you, one of the things that, that I think um, you do really beautifully is you, you weave in, I would say you weave in so, social political issues without even really hitting it over the head, but it's rooted in these humanized, flawed, wonderful characters like you talk about gentrification which is absolutely an issue that has to be tackled at this moment if we're going to talk about being anti-racist right um and so i guess just i we're running uh, um close to to the end here but just i kind of want to let you um yeah talk about that really quickly just kind of mention why how that uh has made its way into your storytelling I mean, it, it made its way into my storytelling because my family has been victim victims of gentrification. Um, when elders in my family die, they oftentimes were given predatory reverse mortgages, and then they lose the home, and it goes to the bank, and then we no longer have that house in the family. And that has happened in multiple areas across Denver. So it made its way into my work. It's because I'm, I'm actively experiencing grieving at losing the places that we come from along with many people in my city. Um, another reason it's in my work is because I was a Chicana and Chicano studies minor in college at Metro State University of Denver. Mm -hmm. And that sort of really radicalized me. It, um, it grounded me in theory and it allowed me to see, um, you know, there's larger frameworks at work that have held my people down for generations. And I like to take story and sort of reveal those sort of those areas where it's really happening. And, you know, some people are out there, you know, protesting and some people are out there trying to change laws and some people are out there. They're making art that it's making people feel this mm -hmm. is wrong. We do right. not need to treat other people like this. This is unjust. And right. I hope that my work allows all of us to have that sense of, you know, maybe there's some justice if we can tell our stories, but the real justice is changing the world that we live in. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I could talk to you for hours. Um, just to wrap up, what, where can people find you? And then I'm gonna pass it over to Julio. Um, what are your, your socials, your website? Yeah, um, my favorite is Instagram. So if you look for Kali Maha, K-A-L-I-M-A-J-A. -A -A. Um, I'm also on Twitter, but I leave every once in a while because it's chaotic. Because it's insane. It's <laughs> yeah, a little bit intense. Insane. It's a bit much, um, yeah. But yeah, say hi to me on Twitter, or on Instagram. Not Twitter, don't say hi. <laughs> yes, and but she's tagged you. on all our stuff. And uh, if you follow Latina Rebel, she's tagged on, on the promos for today. Thank you so much you for so talking much. with me. Thank you so um, much. Please, please, please support Kali's work. Make sure you buy uh, and read and devour Sabrina and Karina. Try to get it at a local bookstore. Order it online from a local bookstore if you can. And uh, we will see you on the worldwide internet. Passing it back to Julio. Thanks, ha! Kali. There you Bye. go. Thank you, Kali. And thank you, Melina. And thank you guys for a really uh, fantastic conversation. I learned a lot. I, I like I said, I love Wednesdays. I just sit back and watch <laughs> and watch Melina just roll with it. But guys, we will be back tomorrow night. And now, if you're becoming a fan of the show, it's like week three. Hi, mom. How are you, mom? My, my mom's mom watching. And my dad are too. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Barbara. You want to say hi? You, you, you know. <laughs> um, but tomorrow night, uh, it's gonna be Melina and myself, just like we did like with Amanda. But we're gonna have. Oh my God! I can't believe him. He said yes. Uh, Julio Salgado is going to be on, and Julio is, I've known him for ages, and uh, 
and fantastic guy. So anyway, we will be back tomorrow night at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7, p- 7 p.m. Pacific. And uh, thanks for all the love, guys. Thanks for all the comments. We're going to keep at it. So big shout out to director Andrew Vasquez, like I always do. Hey, what up, Andy? Andy? And hey, Andy. Uh, and we got to go. We got to go we, eventually. And we're down. Bye, guys. <laughs>